Hey everyone, and welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so happy that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is to go onto our Facebook page and like us there. And if you haven't subscribed yet here on YouTube, go ahead and do so now. That way you can keep up with these. With that said, let's get into our next message in our series, Life to the Full. Well, hey, Foundry Church, we're diving into what Jesus said in John chapter 10, 10, 10, when he said this, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life to the full. And we recognize that um, life to the full is something that God sees. Last week, we looked at and understood God's perspective on things. Remember, God's omnipresent. God is everywhere at all times, which means he has this high up view. He sees it all, but he also is a God who sees closely and intimately and knows us well. So we can trust his perspective. We can trust that he has the best view and we can trust his character that everything he sees and leads us into is in the end leading us to life to the full. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the female perspective. I'm always blown away how um, I can get wisdom when a female perspective, when the female voice is heard, when the female perspective is taken into consideration, I will leave a meeting and I'll be like, that went great. I mean, gold star for this dude. Oh, um, but gold star for me, that was a great meeting. And like, uh, somebody will come and be like, that person's crying. You should, you know, a lady in the office will be like, they seem sad. Well, I'm like, it's all right. Just shared some truth. And like, no, that was mean, right? And a female perspective can say, maybe you shouldn't say it that way. Maybe you should have a little tenderness, have some context, share some positive. Like the female perspective, the female wisdom is often, well, let's just say it this way. There has been more than once on family road trips where Erica says, you know, I think the kids might need to eat within the next half hour. Now, I'm somebody who's like, hey, everybody, we're not peeing for seven hours. Go, go like, like something's chasing us. And, um, and she'll be like, I think the kids need to eat. And I would say sometimes I've listened to that. And other times I'm like, why are they all screaming? What happened? And it's usually about 33 minutes after she told me that. The female perspective says, hey, you might want to pay attention to your surroundings. In Scripture, in the Bible, the book of Proverbs speaks of wisdom. And when it speaks of wisdom, I'm not going to try to say the word. I've tried to practice it today, but it just doesn't work for my tongue. But the, the word for wisdom in Hebrew is gendered female. So she speaks, right? So it's a female pronoun when it talks of wisdom. It says wisdom is in the streets and she is calling out. So we see that wisdom has this female gender um, attributed to it. There's a feminine side to it. And God's wisdom, so God has that same description. The female description of wisdom is in the nature of God. It's one of the traits of God. If you look at Isaiah 11, there is seven traits of God's spirit. One of the traits of God's spirit is wisdom, and it's gendered female. 
So we need to understand there is a female perspective in it. And, um, and I love the idea that um, God's, God's wisdom speaks in a feminine voice. I love that because quite often the harsh, brash tone of the masculine voice, it doesn't always smack of wisdom, right? Like, Get over here, you know, and you're a little more barky. And the female voice, the, that female nature really calls us back to the heart of God. Aaron Rodgers said it this way, wisdom is the ability to see life from God's perspective. Not the quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. Not that guy. It's actually Adrian Rodgers. I just have Aaron Rodgers on my mind because I think he's playing against me in fantasy football this week. But um, that's a whole different story. Um, but I love the female perspective. I love the female perspective in Scripture. But I also want to say not every female opinion is a wise one, just like not every male intuition on directions is a correct one, right? We may feel it's right, but not every female opinion is wise, but I do think there's a lot of wisdom in that, and we're going to take a really close look at life to the fullest in the fullest engagement, and we're going to look at it through some stories of women in the Bible. There's going to be three specific stories. Now, remember, if you're a guy in here and you're like, oh, we have to learn about girls, first of all, it's not third grade, don't be weird, but second of all, um, what we want to do is remember this summer we talked only about the male characters of the kings, and all the ladies came every week, and they learned and applied it. Guys, we can do this as well. Don't, don't discount it because it's coming from a female story in the Bible. Engage with it. It speaks truth into your life and my life just the same. So instead of just one character today, just like one king or one person, I want to do something that I have seen ladies do. I'm going to multitask. That's right, right? Like only ladies. I have literally seen women carrying a bucket of water, put a child, put the bucket in the car, the child in it, they're washing a child, going to piano with the other while eating an old chicken strip and cold mac and cheese because they got to get it all done, right? That's a little hyperbolic, but the reality is that we know that ladies can multitask. I can unitask until something shiny goes by and then I'm like, ooh, what was that? And then I get lost, but I have... A wise female who's like, hey, you need to do your work. So we're going to multitask today. And I'm going to see how it goes. I've heard it's awesome. I just don't think it's going to work for me. But um, we'll see. We're going to talk first out of Luke. Chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. It's a story of Mary and Martha. And here's how it goes. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, they came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him, and I want you to hear, like sometimes we make scripture seem so nice. Like, you know, Martha comes up like in a nun's habit. Lord, you know, but I want you to picture it a little more with me like two sisters. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. Because that's more of, I think that's more of what you get, right? Because it's never like, in our homes, it's never like, would you please ask the eldest to assist me in taking out the garbage? That's never how it sounds. So she's like, Lord, come on. She's not even helping me. Can you tell her to help? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, there's only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better, and I'm not taking it away from her. So let's talk for just a minute about busyness versus engagement. We have a cultural value on our lives that we think busy is important. How you doing? Man, I'm busy. What'd you do? I slept till 11, and I had coffee for four hours, and now I'm talking to you. But I am busy, right? Because if we're busy, we're important. But there's a difference between busyness and engagement. What's the difference? What's the difference? Like you look at Martha. The woman is doing all she can, all she can to, to provide for Jesus. But the key is relationship. We can fill every minute with good, important, necessary, busy things. But it doesn't mean that it's the right thing. You and I quite often fill our lives with busy, good, important things. But the question isn't, are they good? The question really comes back, is it the right thing? 
Is it the thing we're supposed to be engaged with? So here's what we have to do. We have to learn the discipline and the, and the growth point in our life of asking the one who has the fullest perspective to show us the difference between good and the best thing. The good thing and the best thing. Ask the one who has the fullest perspective. Ask God to show us how we can see life on his terms and live with wisdom. Because we can get very busy in this life, and we can do a lot of good things at the expense of the very one thing we were meant to do. And for you and I, that is a costly mistake. That is a costly mistake. Maybe it's like this for you. Um, sometimes, like, you know, I do like going to the, the grocery store once in a while because I'll put my headphones in, I'll listen to a podcast, I put my head down, and I'll be like, just give me a list. I love little lists at the grocery store, and I'm like, green beans, check, you know, and I'm like, asparagus, why? But I, I go and I get the things I'm supposed to get, and I really, it's kind of weird, I enjoy it, right? But I can't go to the grocery store hungry because I will get many good things, but they won't be the best thing. They won't be on my list, and I'll come home, and it'll be like all the stuff there, and it's like, where's like the rotisserie chicken? Oh, I think it's still rotisserizing because I didn't grab it, right? I didn't get it. I was getting everything else but the thing I was meant to grab. We get a lot of good things, but we miss the best thing. We miss what we're actually meant to do. And for you and I, we recognize that busyness versus engagement is a big issue in our culture because engagement means that we are engaging with God on his terms for his glory and his kingdom. Busyness says, I'm doing everything I can to appear as though my time, my talent, my treasure are valuable. And we never want to dismiss that God has already made our time, treasure, and talent valuable by the presence of his spirit in our life his purposes don't miss a good don't get good things at the expense of the best thing the next story we'd like to talk about is um, the story of the woman in Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 31 we read a story and actually I'm just going to dive right into it it's a great narrative on a woman of noble character. It says this, uh, starting in verse 10. A wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it's still night and provides food for her family and portions for her servants. She considers a field and she buys it out of her own earnings. She plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with the other. That's how you make thread. And she opens her arms to the poor, extends her hands to the needy when it snows. She has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. They're well covered. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gates where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom. That's that female word, the wisdom. Chokmah, I think it's called. I, it's it's this, this Hebrew word that is the feminine nature of God. She speaks. The feminine nature of God speaks through her and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring praise at the city gates. Man. I'm tired after reading about that lady. Like, I'm like, you get up when it's still dark and you do all that stuff? Like, she's a real estate mogul, a clothing manufacturer. She does everything. And at first you may wonder, like, didn't we just learn about Martha who was working too hard? I feel like you're catching us with both sides here. Isn't there something, like, what's the difference between this woman and Martha? And if you read your devotions this week, you would have seen and heard the difference. I love this quote. 
our relation, and this comes right out of day three on devotions this past week. If you don't get devotions, you can grab them at the entrances or exits of the church or catch your campus pastor for them. It says this, our relationship with Jesus comes first. Out of that relationship, we are led to pour our time and energy into actions and relationships that are life-giving to us and to the world around us. I, yes and amen to that. Our relationship with Jesus comes first. And if you look at this woman, the difference between her and Martha is this. Martha was like, hey, can you make her help me? I'm doing all the work. Can you make her, come on, look at me. I am like working super hard. And lazy Mary won't work. Help me out. It's all about Martha. Look at the heart of the wise woman. The woman who speaks the wisdom of God. She's like twice as busy. And God's like, that's the kind of woman that I clap for. That's the kind of woman who brings praise at the city gates. That, what's the difference? The difference is her motivation is on the relationships. We need to get down to the understanding that this woman was busy, she was industrious, and she served those around her. She served at great personal expense those around her. It does. It makes me think, and I know not all moms are like this, but man, I don't know anybody who works as hard as a mom. It is. It's crazy. Like, when I look at it, I'm like, man, like everything. The kid's are like, hey, mom, where's that paper from three years ago with my picture on it? I need it for, you know, school tomorrow morning. She's like, bottom drawer, you know, left file with a green tab. And I'm like, there's a drawer with tabs? Like, I don't even know. And you look at it and like, that is amazing. Why? Because there's an industriousness that is serving other people. It's rooted in relationship. They serve those around them. With their time, they're not given to idle time. And that's really where, not I-D-O-L, but idle time, I-D-L-E, time with nothing to do, with, with just nothing there. Her idle time is not present because she is busy and engaged in life to the full. She is fully engaged in the life around her. And when we see that woman, we should long for something of her to be in our life. And that voice that drives her and compels her to serve at great personal expense. I want to turn now to the final uh, kind of female character in this today. To the woman Esther. To Esther. And um, Esther is a fascinating story. She is part of the um, Jewish exiles. She's in the kingdom of Persia under the king Xerxes. They oversaw 127 provinces from India all the way into deep into the Mediterranean towards, uh, you know, like they were trying to conquer uh, Greece at the time. So we know this, a vast empire, a vast empire ruled by Xerxes. She is an orphaned girl who's being raised by her uncle Mordecai, who works in the king's palace. And Queen Vashti, Xerxes' wife, she gets a little lippy after he's been partying and drinking for 127 days. She got upset, and I mean, rightfully so. It just seems a little excessive. But, um, but he has this party, and he wants Vashti to come in, and everybody see how pretty she looks. She's like, yeah, that's not happening, dude. And he deposes her and sends her off. And they make a search of the entire kingdom for all the beautiful women, and Esther is one of them that is brought to the king. She is found to be pleasing in his sight, and she becomes king. Our queen, and we know that this young lady is now becoming queen, right? But we can see what happens when the queen gets out of line. She can be like, you know, like a paper football, just kind of throw them away. So she's in this place, but it's a fragile spot. And she hears about a plot that is being hatched by this kind of Hitler type guy named uh, Haman who is going to wipe out the Jewish people. And her uncle comes to her and he says, Esther. Esther, do you think that if you, that you alone are safe of all the Jewish people, do you think that you won't go to the sword, you and all your family, if you don't do something? Who knows, Esther, that God didn't put you in this position for such a time as this. Stand up, speak up, take the risk, and she risks it all. She risks it all. I remember in the story it says, in Scripture it says, when she kind of makes a decision in her head and she says, so pray for me and fast for three days because on the third day I'm going to see the king. And if I perish, 
I perish. She sets her face in the wind and she's like, I'm doing it. It turns in this beautiful way where the story ends up being very redemptive. And the Hebrews are exalted throughout the entire kingdom. And we even know historically Xerxes is one of the kings who sends the exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So we can look at this and see that God was at work. But the key element is this line. And who knows that you have been brought to this moment for such a time as this. You've been brought to this position. And here's where we're going to talk about some of the characters from this narrative. Remember the thieves and the robbers? Let's talk about them for just a minute because you learned a couple weeks ago that thieves and robbers are the ones who come to steal and kill and destroy. But they were actually people who came and were false messiahs. They were claiming to be the Christ, but they weren't. And Jesus We recognize they came to take, Jesus came and gave his life. Anything in our life that claims to give us life but is a counterfeit is a thief. Anything in your life and in my life that claims to be life-giving that isn't Jesus is a thief and a liar. And after a while, these little, maybe good things, that have a false claim on being something that will give us purpose, give us meaning, give us a sense of, I don't know, importance. These little things will kill and destroy us. And we need to look at it and understand that they may not be bad things. They may be good things. They could be relationships. You could be in relationships that are they're good and they're fine, but they're slowly steering you away from the lordship of Jesus Christ, and you're making compromises and decisions that pull you apart from him, and eventually what it does is it steals, kills, and destroys. It's not always bad, right? It doesn't look bad on the outside. I love how Andy Stanley says it. He says, the question isn't, is it sinful? The question, is it wise? If you make enough unwise decisions in a row, by the time you get to the decision of sin, it's already made. It's already made. And the reality for us is we need to look at some of these things that are, they're good, but are they trying to take the place of Christ's lordship in our life? Are they claiming his spot and his purposes over and against him? So when we look at that, we understand that these three ladies help us ask a few questions. So for the Martha character, we could ask, what busyness is robbing you of fully engaging life to the full. What busyness is is robbing you of fully engaging this life that you were purposed and created for? Are you asking God to order your priorities? Or are you just living in the tyranny of the urgent, in the busyness? Ask God. Ask the one who has greater perspective to say yes to the right things and no to the wrong things. Even if they're good things, ask him for wisdom. Trust him. And here's the hard part. Then obey. Oh, Obedience is the worst, right? Because you can't always, at the foundry, we say it this way. We do what, we obey God, and we do things without guaranteed outcomes. We don't know the end from the beginning. We just know we have to take a step of obedience. Trust him and obey. There's no need to make excuses. Live, here's what we do at the foundry. We kind of go palms up with things, right? Palms up. It means God may put something in your life, and you're like, oh, I super didn't want that in my hand, right? You don't want that, but God puts it in your life. God, what's your purpose for this? What's your purpose for this? When you're, when you're not too busy, you can attend to what God's putting in your life. When God takes something away that you love, you can accept his purpose and plan, and you can live into what he's calling you to do, no matter what he puts into your life or takes from it, the good and the bad. And the reality is we need to recognize there are many things robbing us of our time and getting the top priority from what God's purpose was to what our purposes are. And we can really see that in the life of Martha. She is doing the tyranny of the urgent, and she's wondering why nobody notices her. Why isn't she seen? I I want these things. I'm I'm serving Jesus. He's in my house. I'm working, and Mary is super lazy, and I'm going to call her out, and she's going to get in trouble. But actually, Mary was doing the right thing. She was attending first to the relationship. She recognized that Christ had been put into her life for a short time, and she was going to spend every minute she could with him. For the Proverbs 31 lady, we could ask this, what selfishness is stealing your time? 
What selfishness is stealing your time? Are you on the floor playing with your kids if you have little ones? Are you sitting with your husband, your wife, your friends, your family, no matter what state in life you are? Are you present with the people you're with? Or are you just sitting there like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, yeah, oh, I like that. Oh, that's funny. It's a cat meme. Mm." And your kids are like, you know what I did at school today? Uh Uh-huh, that's great, buddy. Awesome. And like, Dad, I just told you I got kicked in the face on a swing. (laughs) Yeah, that's okay. And we never even pay attention. We live on this thing that takes away from us. Actually, I would love to show you a picture of someone who took away our phones in pictures. So phones that, uh, pictures that had people on their phones, and it shows a posture of what it looks like when you just take the phone away and you can see. Look how sad that is. Everybody's looking down. They're disengaged from the life in front of them. They're at a loss for engagement. They don't know what to do. They're not playing with each other. They're worried about other people's pictures getting more likes than theirs, getting more hits, more follows. And the reality for us is we can live a life that looks a lot like that, fully disengaged from the things that matter most. What selfishness? Make no mistake, these are willful, selfish choices that are taking from what matters most. How are you going to engage Like literally, the number two game right now is Donut County. There are adults ignoring their children at restaurants to sell donuts in a make-believe county on their iPhone. That's happening. Like if you said that to like Socrates, he'd be like, that seems sad for Western civilization, right? And they're like, oh sweet, I sold a Kriller. Who cares? We miss our life because of our selfish choices. Maybe you're perfecting your golf swing or finding the outfit you want because you have 30 extra minutes when instead you could be calling your wife, your friends, somebody you need to be spend time with and have coffee with them. Spend the few minutes. I don't know. Oh, here's a novel idea. Be in devotions. People are like, I just don't have time for devotions, but I sold 1,400 donuts today and I'm a marketeer in Donut County. Like, that is the dumbest answer ever. But we have the living word of God as our other option. We have to understand we are making choices that are selfish and they're stealing, robbing, killing, and destroying our families, our time. They are hurting us. Get into devotions. Don't tell me we don't have time. I have time. I'm in a fantasy football league. I drafted people who don't know my name, and I worry that Erica beat me last week, and I'm not okay with it, but we'll play one more time, right? We're going to, I have time to do devotions. I have time, and not devotions to learn to teach, time to spend time in the Word of God. I have time to serve in the house of God. I have time to be part of groups and relationships that are growing in the Word of God. Get into our weekly rhythm, and don't believe the lie of the selfishness that, you know, I'm just too busy. You're not too busy. You're making choices. Make the choice for the best thing, not just a good thing. Make the right choice. So here's the final thing. For like Esther, if we take her and we look at her, we'd ask the question, where has God put you? Where has God placed you? Maybe you're a mom, a wife, a father, brother, friend, coworker, teammate, aunt, uncle, grandmother, grandfather, I don't know. Maybe you're a distant second cousin twice removed of somebody who needs Jesus. But the reality is, do you realize that you and I often believe God doesn't have perspective on our life? We're like, I don't know why God has me in this season. As though he's stumped with where you're at. As though he doesn't know fully, see fully, and plan fully for your best, fullest engagement in the kingdom of God. God is not surprised at where you're at in life. He has you there purposefully. Have you ever asked the question, God, why do you have me here now? God, what's the point of this? Look at where you're at right now in this life. God puts you there. You are supposed to be on mission. Unapologetically, full-throatedly, full movement on mission. Don't let your kids' lives, if you have kids, like be missed for other things. They're your first mission field. Train your children up in the way they should go so that in the end they don't depart from it. Spend time in the word of God with them. Make time away from these devices and the tyranny of the urgent to be present in their life. They're your first mission field. Don't let it pass by while you're monkeying around on your phone. 
So look at where you're at right now. God put you there. God hasn't been like, it's not like God's playing marbles. Oh, that one went off the table. That's not how it works. God placed you where you're at. You're supposed to make the most of your moment. Don't let your children, who are our first mission field, if you have kids, they're the first mission field. They're the people you're reaching for Christ first. Don't lose the opportunity to invest in them relationally, spiritually, and purposefully because you wanted to sell donuts online. You're an angry bird trying to knock down pig structures. Don't trade such foolish things and don't trade really good things too for the best thing. And the best thing is raising them up for who they're to be in Christ. Maybe you're stuck um, in a horrible carpool, you know, like taking people to like, like driving other people's children and stuff. And you think, why am I in a carpool? Why would God do this to my life every morning, right? What if God put you there to be a light and a witness to people who would never be around Christians if it wasn't for this carpool? Maybe you're called to do something missionally about it. Maybe it's for a reason. Actually, let's take away maybe. It's for a reason. Look at the people who are around you in your office, in the place where you work, in the places you frequent, and ask God, what's your heart for them? Here's the thing. Pick your head up. Pick your head up. We live so often, and it's hilarious if you want. It's not hilarious. It's kind of sad. But most, like, I think in a few years we're all going to have a big hump on the back of our neck because we're all like this. We have our heads down in a little square world that we're missing God's purposes with. Literally, get your head up and start asking God, how can I pray for that person? What's your heart for that weird person over there that I see? How can I pray for them? Get your head up. Ask God to reveal something of his heart for the people around them like Queen Esther did. She realized she was there for such a time as this. You are here for such a time as this. If you hate your job, if you hate it, ask God, why am I here? What do you want me to do with this? Some of us have said, God could never use me here, right? Has anybody else ever said that? Like there's no way God could use me. Okay, only me. I'm good with that. I'm good with being uncomfortable socially. Um, So there's been times where I'm like, God, you can never use me here. Oswald Chambers says it best, and I love how it says, don't say that God can never use you where you are because he certainly can't use you where you're not. I'm like, oh, oh, and the Scottish theologian wins, right? I love that line. He can't use you where you're not. He wants you, he's put you here for a purpose. So here's the reality, here's the challenge. When we look at Martha, when we look at the Proverbs 31 woman, and when we look at Esther, we realize everything is rooted first in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing him, loving him, and getting his heart for the world around you. And then you serve and participate on God's terms in the life he gave you. In the life he gave you. Don't let it pass by. Don't miss the opportunity to live life to the fullest. Remember I said it a couple weeks ago. Have you ever driven home and realized when you get there, oh my word, I don't remember one minute of that drive. I think we may have a generation of people who get to the pearly gates and like, wow, I don't remember much after like my 14th birthday. I quit growing. I quit developing. I quit believing there was an upward purpose that my utmost was for his highest, that my life was to give glory to God. Here's the reality. Church, may it never be said of us that we didn't know we were called. We were called to be aware of the thieves and robbers, and we were called into his image, not our own. Be transformed and live faithfully for him because God has placed you for his glory in this moment. Make the most of it. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are. Guard us, keep us, and transform us, we pray. May we not accept the the busyness as the answer for our purpose, but may we only find what is your best, what is your highest and best for our lives, and then obediently live into it. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we ask that you would take now our lives and use them for the praise of your glory. Guard our hearts, we ask, so that we cannot be robbed of the precious time, the time we can't get back, that we would not be robbed of that time, because you guard our hearts and you call us clearly to yourself, to your purposes for the glory of Christ. May that be true of us, that we were people who purposely lived for the glory of the one who died for us, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. 
Hey, thanks again for joining us for this week's message. If you're looking to prepare yourself for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our weekly devotions page. Devotions are a crucial part of our weekly rhythm here at The Foundry. We really hope that God spoke something powerful into your life today and we hope that you'll join us again next week.